Almost 150 years ago, he reached the distant shores in the northeast of New Guinea, where no white man had ever set foot. Miklucha Maklai was the first. The Aborigines used to call him Tamo Rus, the Russian man, or Karam Tamo, the man from the moon. Maklai was a good man. Everyone saw him as a good man. He never turned his back on anyone who came to him. They also said he was a man from the moon because he came from the moon. He was white and at night when you see the moon it's also white. That's why everyone said he came from the moon. He always kept his word and acted upon his promises. That's how he treated Tui and others. And everyone called him the man from the moon. In the local tongue, they also called him Karam Tamo. How Tui behaved, so do we. Tui's fifth generation. We love people in the same way. Tui always used to welcome guests, all those who came from afar to the village of Gorendu. More than 10,000 kilometers away from Papua New Guinea in St. Petersburg, Russia, where the great scientist and explorer set out on his journeys from, his descendant lives. And he also bears the name Nikolai Miklucha Maklai. I'm the great-grand-nephew of that very celebrated Nikolai Miklucha Maklai. In our family, we have two branches, an Australian one, starting with his sons Alexander and Vladimir, who were brought to Australia by Maklai's spouse, Margaret, after his death, and another branch coming from his elder brother, Sergei. This is a Russian branch. As a full namesake of Nikolai, I definitely bear full responsibility for continuing his work and telling the new generation about his effort in order to preserve the memory of him these days, as well as in the future. The future famous traveller and ethnographer was born on the 17th of July 1846 in the village of Yazykovo Rajdestvinskoye of the Novgorod Governorate, in a noble family. He had three brothers and a sister. Neither their family manor nor the village survived to this day in their original form. However, there is a monument to Nikolai Miklucha Maklai in the town of Akulovka, located nearby. Every year on the scientist's birthday, they celebrate the Ethnographer's Day there and hold the Maclai readings that gather together the explorers, descendants, ethnographers, regional history experts, writers and journalists, as well as guests and local residents. At the local school, every student knows about their great countryman. The breath of the Stone Age from the Ghanaian foothills you'll feel on your face as you open this diary. A primeval man you shall walk here and sleep by a bonfire at the threshold of history. So kind are the children of nature, with needles of bone and an oak pickaxe. You'll see the life of the ancients before the Stone Age entirely free. Nikolai Miklucha Maklai was first educated at home. Then his family moved to St. Petersburg and he entered the second St. Petersburg Gymnasium. These are the tables and benches used by the gymnasium students back then. The future scientist entered the gymnasium with his brother Sergei in 1859. Nikolai was 13 at that time. For several generations of students, the daring explorer with an unusual surname was a symbol of journeys to faraway lands. Yet what do people in no way connected with any of the places where Miklucha Maklai lived or studied know about him today? Which Russian travelers do you know? Off the top of my head, I can't really think of anyone. Afanasy Nikitin, Konyukhov, Cook, 
I need to think about it. Brzevalski. Mm, there were many. Lazarev, Billingshausen. Well, the first we covered at school was Miklucha Maklai. Does the name Miklucha Maklai tell you anything? No. Miklucha Maklai. Yes, it does, but I can't remember what he discovered. Yes, I've heard this name, but I'll hardly be able to tell you more. Yes, he's also a traveler, but I can't remember anything about him. Unfortunately. He's one of the Russian travelers, but I've forgotten the details about him. Well, yeah, I know him. Yes, this name does tell me something. He was a Russian traveler. I didn't study his biography, so it's hard to say. I've heard about him. Just the name and surname. I think he lived with those Papuans for a long time. He was a true ethnographer and thought one could only understand people by living with them, adopting their culture and customs. This is what I know about him. We learnt about Nikolai Mikhlocha Maklai from books, our school curriculum and movies. In the last 30 years, virtually nothing has been done to preserve the memory of Mikhlocha Maklai and it's only thanks to the older generation, who imparted their knowledge to the younger, that the memory still remains. So it is my responsibility and that of the older generation to pass down the knowledge that in Russia there truly are people to look up to, those who used to be the reference point and example for entire generations to be brought up. Up. To celebrate the 170th anniversary of Miklucha Maklai's birth, the headquarters of the Russian Geographical Society in St. Petersburg organized an exhibition dedicated to the life and scientific work of the great traveler. Visitors could see Miklucha Maklai's photos and expedition diaries, as well as his unique drawings. In fact, these artful and accurate sketches have proved no less important to science than his notes. The love of drawing was implanted in Miklucha Maklai in his childhood by his father, Nikolai, who was the head of the Petersburg passenger station of the Petersburg-Moscow Railroad, as well as the head of the Nikolaevsky railway station, these days called Moskovsky. The future traveler even wished to enter the Academy of Arts, yet his mother dissuaded him. At the age of 17, he enrolled at the St. Petersburg University, from which he was later expelled for taking part in a student movement. Together with his brother Sergei, Nikolai even managed to spend three days under arrest in the Peter and Paul fortress. Miklucha Maklai received further education at the universities of Heidelberg, Leipzig and Jena. He attended the lectures of celebrated Ernst Haeckel, who was a young zoology professor back then. It was with that professor, with that very famous German scientist, that Nikolai Miklucha Maklai first traveled to the Canary Islands. Initially, Maklai studied zoology and medicine. In particular, in the Canary Islands, he discovered a new species of sea sponge. And it was after the publication of his work that he started using a double surname, Miklucha Maklai. Miklucha was the surname of the Cossack who in the Battle of Jovte Vode captured Michael Maklai, a Scottish baron who fought for the Poles but settled down with the Cossacks later, marrying a woman by the name of Miklucha and adopting her family name. We and all our ancestors before Nikolai Miklucha Maklai used the surname Miklucha, but due to his extensive foreign travels he added the surname Maklai, so the current name Miklucha Maklai emerged. The Canary Islands expedition greatly impressed the young scientist. He was overcome with a hunger for travel and discovery. Upon arriving back in Russia as a famous and talented scientist recognized in Europe, as well as around the world, Nikolai Miklucha Maklai submitted to the Russian Geographical Society a draft project of an expedition to New Guinea. But it wasn't approved as the charter of the Russian Geographical Society only provided for the study of Russia and the bordering countries, while New Guinea was in no way within its scope of interest. Nevertheless, Miklucha Maklai kept pursuing his goal, requesting audiences with Grand Dukes until the Imperial Russian Geographical Society finally granted him a small subsidy and Grand Duke Konstantin Romanov ordered that the traveler be accepted on board of the corvette Vitez or the Knight. 
Setting out on his voyage, Maclay requested from Grand Duke Constantine that the ship return in a year's time to collect his diaries. He didn't even think of coming back. Mikluka Maclay was one of the first to put forth a theory of racial equality. He was driven by a noble goal to prove that Papuans were not an intermediary link in human evolution like many thought at that time, but the same Homo sapiens as Europeans. So, in 1870, the naval corvette, Vitias, with a 24-year-old scientist, Miklucha Maclay, aboard, set out toward the coast of New Guinea. Leaving Kronstadt and moving past Denmark, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands and Great Britain, they first reached the island of Madeira, then those of Cape Verde. Leaving Rio de Janeiro, the Strait of Magellan, the Easter Island, the Samoan Islands, the island of Ratuma and New Ireland behind, on day 316, the ship finally reached New Guinea. It happened on the 19th of September, 1871. From the deck of the Vitias, the young scientists could see cloud-capped mountains with a dense black tropical forest below, coming up to the ocean. The trees wrapped in vines lowered their crowns right to the surface of the water. On that very day, the first lines were written of one of the most remarkable books in human history, that of the famous Maclay's Diary. The current was favorable and we were moving forward fast. After 1 p.m., the corvette Vitias came so close to the coast of New Guinea that we could see its characteristic features. Thick clouds were resting on the mountain tops. On the coast, plumes of smoke were visible in two places, signifying human presence. We spent one year out in the sea and are now nearing the islands most distant and dangerous for exploration, which lie in the Pacific Ocean between India and Australia. In particular, the biggest one called New Guinea, with its impenetrable jungle, lofty mountains and savage population belonging to the Papuan race, which is allegedly closer to beasts than men. And I want to commit myself to the study of these primitive people and everything that surrounds them. In 1984, when I was in the Russian Geographical Society with my grandma Karina Miklucha Maklai, I watched the film featuring Yuri Salomin as Miklucha Maklai for the first time. And of course, it gave me a great feeling to see him on the coast of Maklai, visualizing all the events in the movie. Never did I imagine we would be friends. And let me tell you frankly, he was a true Miklucha Maklai and managed to show people how hard it was and what a heroic feat our great Russian traveler performed. May I come in? Yes, please. Glad to see you. The main character, Yuri Salomin, who played the famous traveler, was also the director of the film. Since Yuri's childhood, Miklucha Maklai has been a true hero for him, taking root in his heart. It was the memory of him that inspired me. And I wanted to preserve the memory of this man. Make him known even better than he is from books. You see, I think the memory of such people, we have monuments, museums and institutes. I think it could be extremely interesting to students, to school children. I'm so sorry to lose such a passenger, and I regret even more losing such a fellow countryman as you. Seems like you're burying me. Yes, what you're about to do is suicide. Take weapons with you at least. No. I wanted to draw attention to those Navy men who were watching Maclay go. If I was walking away into the forest or mountains, it would be one thing. But when they say goodbye, he turns and they keep watching him, realizing he might never be back. 
I'm extremely grateful to those fellow actors. One might think there was nothing special to act out, yet there was. And what was that ship that arrived at the coast of Maclay? It was a bark called Tavarish, or the Comrade. It was in many films, and it was great value, especially for doing master shots. The Yalta Film Studio helped film this. The coast of Maclay was on the coast of the Black Sea. We filmed all that in the Yalta Park. We shot a lot there. Almost 150 years ago, no one knew much about the life of these people. The island remained mysterious and poorly studied. Sailors helped to build a hut for the scientist and brought there everything he needed. The crew of the corvette Vitas was getting ready to depart. On the 27th of September 1871, Miklucha Maklai gave them a farewell note for his family. My dearest mother and sister, finally I'm here. I'll be staying in New Guinea for a year. There will be a lot of hard work, but I hope it will be a success. Farewell and remember me. In the film, the character played by Yuri Salomin refused to take even a handgun with him. In fact, McClyde did have weapons. However, the traveler believed it would not be arms that could help him in that unexplored land, but rather respect and amicability, understanding and trust. He would later write in his diary, My power should lie in composure and patience. On the very first day of his landing on the coast, Miklucha Makai met a Papuan who was to play a crucial part in his life. The name of Tui has truly become historic and is invariably used together with that of Miklucha Makai. That Papuan was of middle height, the color of dark chocolate, with short and curly matte black hair, like that of a Negro, a wide flat nose, eyes peering out under the prominent brow ridges, and a big mouth. He was well built, with fairly well developed muscles. The countenance of my first acquaintance seemed to me quite likeable. Tui was the first Papuan to see a white man. He met Miklucha Maklai and thought he was a man from the moon, or the moon man as they used to say. It was Tui who became his first friend, and this story will be later passed down by Tui's family, the story of their friendship with Maclay, how they protected him and he protected them. Tui was the first man in Gorendo. He was the leader of the whole of Gorendo. He did a lot of good for the people. He shared his food and things. He did everything well. Such was Tui. He held great feasts for everyone, killed pigs and shared them. That's what Tui did. The 1st of October 1871 became a special day for Maclay. He visited the village for the first time. As I entered the grounds, I saw a group of men armed with spears standing in the middle. There were neither women nor children, apparently they were hiding. Seeing me, several indigenes raised their spears and some of them assumed a warlike posture as if preparing to launch a spear. In the end, the Papuans did fire a couple of arrows very close to Miklucha Maklai and were watching him inquisitively to study his reaction. Yet the explorer found a nice spot in the shade, brought his new mat and stretching out there with a great relish, fell asleep. While he was sleeping, no one wanted to shoot him. And those who were shooting before didn't do it in order to kill Maclay. All the arrows flew above his head. If we remember how he entered the village and lay down when everyone expected him to pull out a gun, yet he lay down and slept right in the middle of the village, it must have required a great courage. He thought if he might die, death could come only once. And they didn't try to kill him, but rather started watching and studying who he was, and when they saw he wasn't afraid of them at all, they felt respect. I often noticed that the indigenes liked the way I behaved. They saw I was open with them and didn't wish to see more than they wanted to show me. 
они прятали всегда женщин. It didn't take Maclay long to befriend the villagers of Gorendo, Bongo and Gumbu, so he could collect material for his studies for days on end. At that time, European books on anthropology claimed that the Papuan race was distinguished by tufted hair. The scientists believed this was nonsense. Miklucha Maclay managed to study the head of a nine-year-old boy from Bongu, who had a short haircut and even made some sketches. After the guests had departed, Maclay made an entry in his diary throwing light on the matter that used to worry scientists so much. Their hair does not grow in separate groups or bunches, but is distributed evenly in the same way as ours. That observation for many people, an apparently minor one, put me in a good mood. Within three months, Maclay could talk to Papuans, yet an impetus was still needed to take their relationship to the new level. One day in February, a tree fell on Mikluka Maclay's friend, Tui, from the village of Gorendo, hitting him hard on the head. Maclay was tireless at paying regular visits and dressing Tui's wound, which made him and the villagers closer than ever. He said, Oh, Abba. Oh, my friend. You are very ill. What are you feeling? What are your hands feeling? I'm all right, the illness is gone, answered Tui. Then he hugged him and said it was very good. While I'm alive, you will keep on living. The degree of confidence in Miklucha Maklai grew to such an extent that women were no longer hiding when he entered the village, and the place where the traveller lived was called by no other name than the coast of Maklai. Of course, they offered him wives. It was important to them because they wanted to become related to Miklucha Maklai through marriage. The tribe that would be kin to him could become the strongest as Maklai was a superior man, maybe even a deity. We chose a young beautiful girl. We wanted to give her to him, but Maklai said, No, it's not what I came for. So he told them she would be his sister and he wouldn't marry anyone. That appeased the Papuans. If they knew he wasn't going to marry anyone, it meant neither of the tribes or settlements would become the strongest. The stories about the man from the moon traveled from one village to another, breaking not only linguistic but also tribal barriers. The Papuans believed that if Maclay got angry, he could set fire to the sea. Such a belief was based on an episode which the traveller purposefully staged. He poured some water into a saucer filled with spirit and set it on fire. Maclay's fame preceded him, while he continued studying mountain villages, returning with a great number of drawings, diary notes and various artefacts, and leaving the villagers with good memories of his stay. Meanwhile, the hour of his departure drew near. On the 19th of December 1872, the clipper Izumrud, or the Emerald, sent by the Russian government to search for the traveller, reached the island. As Izumrud entered Astrolay Bay, Russian sailors witnessed an unusual sight. A Russian flag was flying and aboard the ship there was the Russian scientist. Skin and bone, his clothes ragged. But he was talking quite fluently to the Papuans in the local tongue. And they understood him perfectly. Maclay bid farewell and promised to return. Their voyage was a long one. The clipper passed the islands of Ternate, Tidore and Sulawesi, reaching Manila, when Miklucha Maclay had a chance to go up into the mountains and live with the Negritos of Luzon. Then, passing Hong Kong and Singapore, the ship arrived in Java. Having made it to Java, Miklucha Maclay recovered and made up his mind about his future plans. He realized that from then on his major goal was an anthropological and cultural study of the Papuans and peoples of Melanesia as a whole. During his second expedition to New Guinea, he focused on Papua Koviai, 
a small area on the southwestern coast of the island. It could be reached quite easily. It took him 20 days to get to Ambon Island by ferry, where he had to chain for a small local boat which took him through several islands to Cape Iva on the Papua Kavai coast. As he wrote in his journal on March the 8th, 1874, Now I can finally say that I am a resident of New Guinea again. A hotbed of corrupt civilization with pillage, violence, greed for money and human trafficking. That was what Nikolai witnessed in Papua Kovai, which made such a stark contrast with the Maklai coast. Maklai also fell victim to a raid himself. While he was penetrating deeper into the island, a group of armed Papuans raided his cabin and stole his property, murdering and wounding several people. Maklai captured one of the bandits, tied him up and took him to court. In late 1874, Miklucha Maklai went on an expedition around the Malay Peninsula in search of the Orangutan tribe. Anthropological observations and linguistic studies were his top priority. The pages of his travel journeys were filled with new records and drawings. In early 1876, Miklucha Maklai made a decision to visit his favorite coast again. He boarded the Seabird Merchant Schooner, which delivered goods to different islands of Micronesia and Melanesia. He also had a chance to explore the life of the Palau and Yap Islanders before he could finally make out the familiar coastline of Astrolabe Bay. The villagers, who still had a fresh memory of Maclay, took his return for granted as he had promised to do so. He set to work straight away, despite the bouts of fever torturing him for many years. He discovered new places across the island, treating everyone as an equal and helping to avert tribal warfare. Tribal wars were an integral part of the Papuan social life, not only on the Maklai coast, but also in other areas of New Guinea. It was something Miklucha Maklai naturally came across and made every effort to avoid. Faced with this challenging task, Miklucha Maklai resorted to a trick. He told the Papuans that if the villagers started fighting and killing each other, they would suffer terrible retribution. The Papuans believed him, fearing that if they made war, Maklai's words would come true and they would be punished with a massive earthquake. On November the 6th, 1877, the Flower of Yarrow schooner took Maclay away from his beloved land for the second time. He left his property, house and garden with a certainty that he would come back later for a longer period. In the meantime, after several months in Singapore, Sydney was his next destination point. Miklucha Maclay could not go back to Russia for want of money. Through the efforts of Sir William John Maclay, President of the Linnaean Society of New South Wales, the project of a biological research station envisioned by Maclay was brought to life. It was finally built at Watson's Bay. But it wasn't just science that Maclay had passion for. From then on, it was in Sydney that he found his true love. In Australia, he met a young 25-year-old widow, Margaret Robinson Clark. Although she was willing to accept his proposal, her family strongly opposed their marriage. Firstly, Margaret was a Protestant, while Maclay was Russian Orthodox. Second, she was the daughter of the Premier of one of the Australian states, while Maclay, though noble by descent, had nothing to call his own. But the main reason was that Margaret was receiving a widow's allowance, which brought her a certain sum of money year after year. With remarriage, she and hence her family would have no more access to this money. However, Margaret and Maclay never lost the hope of getting married. She was ready to wait for his return from any voyage. From 1879 to 1881, Miklucha Maklai traveled across Oceania several times. A 
and every time he was convinced that fieldwork gave a more correct understanding of people rather than reading literature. After visiting the Solomon Islands, he passed the southern coast of New Guinea to come back to Sydney in 1881. The study of everyday life of Oceania's tribes gave birth to an array of new records, observations and drawings. In February of 1882, Miklucha Maklai set off from Australia to Singapore on board the Vesnik, Asia and Piotr Veliki ships on his way to Europe and then back to Russia. I will probably be in Kronstadt in late July, he noted in a letter to his younger brother, Mikhail. In 1882, following 12 years of traveling, Maklai was returning to Russia with a great wealth of knowledge and a multitude of collections which he wanted to hand over in Russia and nowhere else. On his way there, he also delivered presentations in Europe. The Royal Society even proposed publishing his journals to fund his expedition. But his response was, I serve not just science but also my homeland. The new journey began in 1883. Miklucha Maklai headed for Genoa via The Hague, Paris and London. Then he took a ferry from Port Said to Batavia, where he changed for the Russian corvette Skobelev, bound for Astrolabe Bay, where he finally debarked. Maclay visited the Maclay coast three times, spending there a total of 30 months. His third journey, however, lasted for no more than six days. It was during that time that he brought to the Papuans a young bull and some goats as a gift. The bull seemed so bizarre to them that they thought it was a big swine. The bull ran away into the woods, leaving them scared to death, but it still makes part of their legends. This land became very dear to Maclay. However, it was time to go back. On the morning of March the 23rd, the explorer was heading for the open sea, admiring the coast of New Guinea for the last time. He was making his way back to Sydney to see Margaret. In 1884, Maclay made up his mind to put an end to a period of uncertainty and get married. His beloved was Margaret Robertson Clark, daughter of the Premier of New South Wales, a high-profile government official in Australia. Margaret was born into a Protestant family, while Nikolai was Russian Orthodox. The only way they could marry was in the Protestant ceremony. That was the condition of Sir Robertson, Margaret's father. Maclay had to secure the approval of the Holy Synod and the Emperor for the marriage to proceed. In 1886, the explorer returned to Russia armed with bulky luggage and an ambitious plan of action. He traveled through Alexandria, Odessa, Yalta and Marlin, where he visited his mother to finally reach St. Petersburg. Miklucha Maklai's contribution was held in high esteem by the famous Russian writer Leo Tolstoy. You have definitely proven in practice that a man is a man anywhere and can and has to be approached only with kindness and truth rather than with cannons and vodka. In 1887, Miklucha Maklai traveled back to Australia in the hope of bringing his wife and son straight to Russia. He made his way via Odessa and Alexandria to Sydney, returning to St. Petersburg through Genoa and Vienna. A letter written by Margaret while waiting for her husband to come to Australia for her was brimming with love and anticipation of the encounter. Thinking about the moment we will meet makes me feel so happy. I still cannot imagine it clearly and I have been so excited since the very morning. I will follow you wherever you may want to take me. Here it is, Galerna Street, where Miklucha Maklai lived with his wife Margaret. I'm lucky to be met by Lev Wolfovich. Hello. You promised to tell me something. Shall we go? Come in. These are the stairs Miklucha Maklai used to mount to get to his flat. And here he is. This is a fine painting by a contemporary artist featuring the most celebrated occupants of this old house. Here we see Alexander Pushkin, Nikolai Miklucha Maklai Sr. and Pyotr Shilovsky. Ну вот и дверь, я так понимаю.
and I believe this door leads to Miklucha Maklai's flat. Yes, Miklucha Maklai Sr. settled down here back in July of 1887, after bringing his wife and sons from Sydney. It was here that he spent, sad to say, the last but happy months of his life with his family. Today the building accommodates a hotel. This is one of the hotel rooms. Anyone who stays here is lucky to experience the atmosphere of a house that was once home to the prominent scientist and explorer. There are several landmarks in St. Petersburg that are intimately linked to the Mikluka Maklai family history. Take a look, we're surrounded by sites that are somehow associated with the life and work of Mikluka Maklai and your family as a whole. Otto von Bismarck, for instance, lived not far away from his house. If you look at the dates, you'll realize that during that time, Maklai was studying at the second St. Petersburg Gymnasium, still located in Kazanskaya Street, while Bismarck was serving as Prussia's envoy at the Russian Imperial Court. It was much later when Bismarck was already known as Germany's Iron Chancellor that Maklai, mindful of the Papuan Aborigine sentiment, wrote him a letter protesting against the colonization of the Maklai coast by the German Empire. Another celebrated person living near the house where Miklucha Maklai spent the rest of his life was a famous Russian physician, Sergei Botkin, who admitted the explorer to his clinic on February the 19th, 1888. Botkin treated him for tropical diseases, which were completely unknown to medicine in those times. Some of them are still an issue to be settled, to be honest. But at that time, Botkin had recourse to all possible medical advances, treating Maklucha Maklai with both water cures and shock therapy. And he must have lent him a helping hand in some sense, though eventually failing to rescue him. There was a specific reason for this failure. It was much later that Miklucha Maklai was finally diagnosed with cancer. He died in St. Petersburg at the age of 42. Maklai was buried in the Volkova Cemetery next to his father Nicholas and his sister. It is there that his grave can still be found. It bears an inscription left by his wife reading, Nothing except for death will part us as deciphered in the late 20th century, as well as a monogram showing two underlined M letters. That's what he used to sign his records. It was only a century after Miklucha Maklai set foot on the Papuan shore for the first time that Soviet expeditions were sent to New Guinea again in 1971 and 1977. I'm going to visit Daniel Tumarkin. He has been to the Maklai coast before and I expect him to share his experience and impressions. This is so important for me to know. Mr. Tumarkin, I'm so glad to see you. Thank you for the finding the time to meet me. So am I, please take a seat. Thank you. Can you tell me about your expedition and journey to the Maklai coast? With great pleasure. Daniel Tumarkin is a Soviet and Russian scientist and expert on Oceania's ethnography and history, who supervised the ethnographic teams of the New Guinea expeditions in 1971 and 1977. In 1971, the research vessel, the Dmitry Mendeleev, left Vladivostok, went as far as Singapore, crossed the equator and arrived in New Guinea. Following almost a month of travel, a team of seven was finally able to reach the Maklai coast on a boat. Many islanders had already crowded onto the shore looking in astonishment at a large white steamship never seen there before. They all looked rather gloomy, but as soon as we started approaching the land, I cried out a phrase in Bongo, something I'd learned from Miklucha Maklai's journals. 
Otamo Kage Dabe Kabote Simu, which meant, Hello, O people, we are all brothers. Impressed by this greeting, the villagers smiled and invited us to debark. That was how our story started. The Papuans remembered Maklai quite well, so that when expedition members informed them that they came from Tai Maklai, i.e. Maklai's village, their mistrust melted away and they started sharing the stories about their everyday life and holidays with great joy. When boarding the ship to make our way home, we realized there was a lot yet to be discovered and our studies had to continue. This happened six years later, in 1977. Over that time, Papua New Guinea had gained independence, it was no more a colony, it was an independent state. I've had the idea of going to New Guinea since childhood, but it was only in adulthood that I became aware of the fact that I can and must do that. Papua New Guinea and the island of New Guinea seemed to me as far as the moon and space itself. It was evident that you had to become an astronaut to go to space in the Soviet Union. It was not clear at all, though, what you had to do in order to end up in New Guinea provided that the latest expedition there had happened a century before and lasted only a few days. Are descendants entrusted with any special function or mission? That's what I often ask myself, and I sometimes realize that you have to truly feel yourself, experience yourself as a descendant. It's not that every person with a well-known surname will be ready to make the effort and spend energy on some lofty pursuits. As I always tell my elder son, I feel like a runner carrying a relay baton. You have to be a good runner and know how to hand off the baton at the same time. I've gathered together the descendants of Semyonov, Tianshansky, Krusenstern and Rickard because their opinion is important to me. They're people who preserve traditions, passing them down from generation to generation in their family and trying to do something not only for themselves but for humanity as a whole. They have things to share. It is the task of descendants of famous people, including travelers of the 19th and early 20th centuries, to pull back from oblivion that which was forgotten about them in the Soviet times. I was born 102 years after the landing of Nikolai Mikluka Makla on the island of New Guinea, which happened exactly on the 20th of September, and I have my birthday on the 20th of September. Obviously, since my childhood, people kept asking me when I would finally go to New Guinea. So frankly speaking, it was easier to go there than explain why I'm not doing so. Preparation began for the 21st century expedition. For the great traveler's descendant, it was not only important to get to distant Papua New Guinea, but also to facilitate collaboration between the two countries. To compare the life of today with that described in the scientist diary. And finally, to bring the memory of those places back to all those who ever found themselves engrossed in reading about the traveler Miklucha Maklai. Do you know who travelers are? Yes, I do. They're those who travel. They're people who travel to various cities and countries. And you know where Papuans live? In Papua. And what do they look like? They're all black. And they run. What clothes do they wear? Well, they have leaves. They wear little skirts and have thin hair. Thin hair? And why do they have thin hair? So that they don't feel hot. They live in New Guinea. It's an island. And the island is also called the Pacific Ocean. Probably they called it so because it's Pacific and peaceful. And what do you know about the traveler by the name of Mikluka Maklai? Well, he traveled a lot. He can be a biologist, an anthropologist, and maybe a traveler too. And do Papuans like him? Yes. Why? Because they became friends. 
Meanwhile, the Second St. Petersburg Gymnasium has decided to prepare its own address to the Papuans from the Maklai coast. The students have begun studying the language of the village of Bongo. I want to come to you. Right here we will take some earth and take it to the Maklai coast. I think that when Nikolai Miklucha Maklai was born here, he could hardly have imagined that in almost 150 years, they would remember him not only in Yazukova Rajdestvin Square, but also around the globe. That they would revere him and take this earth from a place where he probably played making cakes out of sand to the island of New Guinea. I see a huge educational and, if you will, potential in this expedition for the presence of Russians in New Guinea, in a way, continues the tradition established by Miklucha Maklai. You know, in the 19th century, when Russian Navy ships travelled to distant lands, they called it showing the Russian flag. Similarly, this expedition will also show the Russian flag of today proving the continuity of traditions related to the study of these territories, as well as a friendly attitude of Russian people towards the native population of Oceania. I believe it's extremely important and all I can do is wish success to this expedition. Hello everybody, these are the people most dear to me, they're seeing me off. We're here with Nikitok. Nikitok, please show yourself. Say, I don't yet know I'm seeing Dad off on this expedition, the expedition which he's taking part in. Finally, our expedition Miklucha Maklai, 21st century, the Maklai coast has checked in. Now we're boarding the plane and setting off to the Maklai coast in Papua New Guinea. We've boarded and are heading to Abu Dhabi, then Sydney, where we have a connecting flight landing in Papua New Guinea on the 13th of September at 4 p.m. That's Igor Chininov, he studies material culture and civilization. Igor, can you tell me, why are you going there? I want to study the state of material culture and economy of Bongu villagers these days to see whether any serious innovation has taken place in the region since the Soviet expedition 40 years ago. As you can see, we're taking this very seriously. There's no joking at all. You can see determination in our eyes. And here we have a representative of the Kunstkamera. They probably have an even more serious approach. Is that the case? Arina Lebedeva. Hello, dear friends. I work at the Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography of the Russian Academy of Sciences, which is more widely known as the Kunstkamera. I'm going to the Maklai coast for the first time in my ethnographic career, so I'll be very glad and interested to see the current state of the Papuan culture. What has changed since the times of Maklai and since the Soviet expedition, which Igor mentioned, to find out which innovations have been introduced. I was at school when I first learned about Miklucha Maklai. Like many of my peers, I read popular children's books and knew that he was a great Russian traveler and explorer. His adventures made a deep impression on me back then, and I decided to learn more about him no matter what, especially about the world he studied. So now we're aboard the plane flying to Abu Dhabi, and what is the most pleasant thing is that when they see us with this logo, they ask, where are you going? And when we say we're going to the Papuans from the Maklai coast, everyone gets surprised. Here's Marina, one of the people surprised with how far we have ventured to go. Marina, say a few words. Hey guys, you're awesome. You're very daring and really special. Thank you so much. Not everyone would have had the heart to do what you're doing, to go and meet the Papuans. We'll be waiting for the news, your photos and video reports. Godspeed and good luck. While it took Nikolai Miklucha Maklai almost 10 months to get to New Guinea, we were planning to reach the Maklai coast within two days. However, in Sydney, all of our plans were ruined. Who could have imagined that after a year's preparation for the expedition, we wouldn't be able to get on an Air New Guinea flight waiting for us in Port Moresby? 
As a result, we're now sitting in the Sydney airport thinking about how to get to Papua New Guinea as soon as possible. The problem was we had an expired visa. We had the signatures of everyone possible there and of course we started calling those people. But the thing was it was 6 a.m. local time and 10 p.m. in Moscow. So we just couldn't get anyone on the phone. After two hours at 8 a.m. they finally answered and solved all our problems. So now we're thinking about how to get there. Fortunately, thanks to Nikolai's effort, we managed to get a new visa to Papua New Guinea in just a couple of hours. However, we didn't manage to fly to Port Moresby right away. Our expedition set off on Sunday the 10th of September and today it's the 15th, yet we're still in Brisbane, Australia. Unfortunately, we haven't yet reached New Guinea, but today we've received all the necessary documents and visas so that in an hour we'll be boarding an Air New Guinea flight in order to be in the so long awaited Papua New Guinea. Guys, finally we're standing in the airport of New Guinea in its capital, Port Moresby, and we're going to check in for a flight to Madang, then a short yacht trip and we'll be on the Maklai coast. Our journey started on the 10th of September, today it's the 16th, Independence Day, when the whole country is celebrating and we're hoping to join local people in the festivities. I was so worried that I couldn't sleep for three days and when I finally reached New Guinea I realized I could relax and have a proper sleep. In the end it took the travelers six days instead of two and a half to get to the Maclay coast. Flying from St. Petersburg via Moscow they reached Abu Dhabi and Sydney then the port of Brisbane from where they went to Port Moresby and finally to the city of Madang located on the coast of Astrolabe Bay. When our expedition arrived in Madang, we were met by Peter Barter, a friend of Nikolai's, who helped him organize the expedition. So he went along the Maclay coast towards Cape Garagasi on a big motorboat. I was very lucky to have met Sir Peter Barter while preparing for the expedition just a few months before our departure. He's a big fan of both Russian culture and history and preserves the monument. He even invested his money into preserving the Maklai coast along with the place where Miklucha Maklai's hut used to stand. And I was extremely lucky for it's only thanks to him that this expedition was possible. To be honest, I do think his help was not only his own but it was also Maklai Sr helping. He sent me Sir Peter in order for all this to happen, it couldn't have been otherwise. The voyage on Sir Peter Barter's Snow White ship took around an hour and a half. In the afternoon, the expedition members finally saw the very coast where one day the famous traveler landed, the coast that bears his name. The guests weren't just met, the area was packed with people wanting to meet Maclay's descendant and, as they put it, the people from his village. The first day was truly remarkable. Around 3,000 people gathered to meet us. They were the inhabitants of three villages, Bongo, Gorendo and Gumbu. There were probably people from other villages as well. As one of the Papuans told me, they had sent invitations to their neighbours. In his diary, Maclay wrote that Papuans were excellent actors. Yet I could hardly expect that my first landing on the Maclay coast would be acted out as a kind of pantomime. A Papuan I didn't know at that time started walking towards me. It later turned out he was one of Tui's descendants and he was approaching me in the same way that his ancestors had met the first Maclay. 
Stretching out his hand, he was looking at me as if he had never ever seen a white man in his entire life. Then a couple of Papuans were about to assault me from behind, preparing to shoot their arrows, and he stopped them, and I was holding out some salt for him to taste. As their legend goes, it was salt. He tasted it and realized there was no danger. By the way, according to McClay, in particular in his diary notes, he was holding out a piece of cloth. But the thing is that they remember and pass down their own perspective, their own side of the coin, which is also fascinating. The local population still hands down legends of Miklucha Maklai from generation to generation. For the people of the Maklai coast, their meeting with the members of the 21st century expedition has become the biggest highlight in the last 150 years. People were greeting us almost as if we had come from another planet. They were clearly interested and astonished as they had heard a lot about the people from the lands of Maklai, yet had never actually seen them. The part of the island studied by Miklucha Maklai has hardly changed since his times. There's still neither electricity nor industry, nothing that could have an effect on the Aborigines' way of life. We were accommodated in Gorendu, in one of the family huts. That family granted us the right to stay there. It was a big gesture on their part. The expedition members proceeded with the research last carried out over 40 years ago. They had to find out how the material culture of the Maklai Coast peoples changed over almost 50 years. However, after our landing on the coast, it was clear that they still remembered Miklucha Maklai in the 21st century. In Russia, we don't always remember Maklai. In fact, after 30 years, we have virtually forgotten him and can hardly connect the dots to evaluate his contribution. But Papuans preserve their language, and even some of the words introduced by Maklai, those were the first words, for example, words like corn and axe, confirm that it was the first time that the Stone Age came across metal objects. It was extremely valuable, so they called their children Maklai in order to preserve the memory of Maklai. What is your name? Nikolai. 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 During the meeting with one of Tui's descendants in the village of Gorindu, they showed Miklucha Maklai Jr. national jewelry used by Papuans to this day. This one Tui probably held in his hands. The travelers had an opportunity to taste a real Papuan flavor. This is a lighter. 150 years ago, Miklucha Maklai described how one could always make a fire and warm oneself with the help of such chunks of wood that people used to carry around. And now we can see a wonderful local man carrying around an ember. The Papuan cooking methods have remained almost unchanged throughout many ages. They use a coconut shell to make a traditional fire. Our portable stove exploded. No one was harmed. So now we cook our food Papuan style, using this wonderful fireplace. Right here, I have some vegetables stewing. And soon, our breakfast will be ready. Local vegetables and eggs. <laughs> <laughs> the expedition members were dreaming of meeting Tui's descendants. There proved to be more of them than one could have imagined. <laughs> Unfortunately, for many years we didn't have the chance to visit you, but finally, after so many years, I've hit the jackpot and found myself among you.
one of the coast settlements founded not far from Cope Caragasi, was named after Maclay. Asel lives there, the elder of Tui's family. You look at me, or Tim? Imagine that Tui's entire family standing right behind me. Everyone who's scattered for miles around. And they are now speaking through me. I'm glad you are among us. Thank you for remembering us. Together with the other inhabitants of the Maklai village, Asel looks after the monument to Miklucha Maklai on Cape Garagasi. He has already built a primary school which is also named after the great traveller. 150 students attend it. They study English and local languages as well as culture and mathematics. Maklai Jr. brought from Russia some school books and Russian folk tales in English. Papuans stick to their quiet, slower-paced life. They spend most of their time next to their huts, and they perceive their home not as a castle, but simply as a place where they can sleep. It was the same in the times of Maklai. What is most important is that all the buildings, outbuildings, dwellings and ritual structures have remained virtually unaltered for the last 40 to 50 years. They still rest on stilts, are made of natural materials and have the same dimensions as recorded by the Soviet scientists, which means the tradition has been preserved. Papuans have also preserved their traditional men's houses where young men who wish to enter into a marriage stay for at least a month and take part in special rites guided by a wise mentor. Now we're standing in front of a houseboy, it's the sanctum where initiation takes place. Young lads of various ages, they can be 14 or 20, depending on what their family decides, undergo this procedure. In general, it lasts about three weeks and the details are kept in secret. Yet one fact is certain. We are standing on a territory where no woman, neither white nor local, has ever stepped before. They still hold the initiation of young men so, before entering into a marriage, they take part in all the mystic rites. Moreover, as they say, some young men return to their pagan faith after abandoning Christianity. That's because they respect their culture, ancestors and traditions. And here's the house itself. Those who undergo initiation build it before getting married. They build a house like this. This one is still under construction. In the villages, elders are held in especially high esteem. The expedition members went to the village of Gumbu to meet the current leader. The leader of Gumbu himself, together with his wife, met us and led us into the house. They told us a lot about their household and how it's organized. They keep all these things, passing them down from generation to generation. Of course, clothes change and surely some things are used more than often than others. But what is most important is that apart from the t-shirts which the civilization has given them and which they wear inside out, they still have other clothes which they constantly wear. And these are the traditional clothes which leave much of the body uncovered and are therefore quite convenient in this region. <laughs> this drum is called a barum. It's a slit drum made of a single piece of wood, an entire trunk or log, with a hollow chamber inside. Unlike Akam, which is a handheld drum used during celebrations and the Sing Sing festival, this is a signal drum used to gather the community together in case of emergencies or when it's necessary to meet and discuss something urgently, when someone dies or in other similar cases. Another place where people preserve the stories of Miklucha Maklai is the village of Bilbil. The scientists paid numerous visits to the island located near the current day village and bearing the same name. It doesn't seem much has changed since then. 
The men of Bilbil as well as those from other villages like Bongo still make their dugout canoes and go fishing. One might think the construction is quite simple, just a boat carved out of a tree trunk and fitted with an outrigger for support. However, considering that the construction of such a canoe requires the felling of a tree, chopping it to pieces, giving it the right form and hollowing it out, one starts to appreciate even the simplest dugout. At first, it's not easy for a novice to sail such a canoe, yet here any boy can do it. The inhabitants of Bilbil Bil have a reputation for being good potters. They make their pots smooth and even without a wheel. Ceramics have been exchanged for various goods in many villages of Astrolay Bay for as long as anyone can remember. So you could come across Bilbil Bil pots in the past, just as you can today. In general, Papuans from the northeastern coast of New Guinea eat vegetables and fruit like sweet potatoes and bananas. They eat meat, mostly chicken, only on special occasions and cook a wonderful sauce. Thank you, Drew. Coconut trees are an important source of subsistence for Papuans. They use everything, leaves, shells, fiber and juice, as well as the wood itself. Local people are good at climbing high palm trees using simple mechanisms. The opening process of a coconut with the help of a machete called a parang takes Papuans just a few seconds. Even a child can do that. The villagers go to the city of Madang and sell in the market what they manage to grow in their gardens. For every family, it's an opportunity to have some income, however small it might be. As in the past, the majority of men and women have a family and for them, it's the most valuable thing in their social life. People here rarely remain single, only in case of a serious physical or mental disability. In Gorendu, I've met only two such people. They were both men with physical defects who were born like that because their mothers contracted malaria during pregnancy. Nowadays, although malaria is still widespread, people can protect themselves. Firstly, there are medicines that help prevent this disease. Then there are various mosquito nets and insect repellents. So provided one is prudent enough, the region no longer seems so scary and dangerous as people often imagine. The 146th anniversary of the Great Traveller's landing on the island of New Guinea has become a special day for those on the Maclay coast. It was on that day that the scientist descendant Miklucha Maclay Jr. decided to hold a teleconference between Papua New Guinea and Russia. In order to take part in that, the Grand Chief arrived for the first time, Sir Michael Samare, called the father of the nation and of Papua New Guinea as an independent state. People almost worship him. The idea of a teleconference between such distant countries seemed unrealistic at first. They didn't really believe it was possible. Only the Northwestern Division of the TASS News Agency supported me. First of all, we had to find out whether it was possible to transmit signals from this coast, because you could send an SMS or text message, but a TV broadcast was almost impossible. So Peter Barter helped me with that. They said that the signal was too weak and brought special equipment, which could amplify it in order for us to hold an hour-long conference. We can promote tourism, regular travel and exchange for the citizens of our two countries. Here's what we've done. We've shown it to you in 20, 30 minutes, but it is the real picture of the Maklai coast in the jungle where we've been staying. And we've connected it to Russia. In many ways, this day has become a milestone. Upon the request of Nikolai Mikluka Maklai Jr., the villagers have collected for him some ritual and household items used by them and their ancestors. In the same way as over a century ago, Papuans brought them to the hut of the famous traveler when he made up his collection. I think you've become our brother. 
You come. You. You come to see us and our land. I want to put it around your neck so that you can take it to Russia. There you can take it off and keep it in your room. You're our brother and you're in our heart. That's why I'm putting it round your neck. They're saying, please take it with you to your cold land and remember your kin who live here in Gorendo. Thank you so much. I will try to preserve this most precious gift and a piece of your culture. I consider it a major achievement of our expedition that we have collected items of Papuan material culture and art in the village of Gorendo. Interestingly, the majority of these objects remind us of those collected by Nikolai Miklucha Maklai himself 150 years ago. The people of Papua New Guinea had an opportunity to see the photos of those very items, as well as the drawings from Miklucha Maklai's collection stored in the St. Petersburg Kunstkammer. The Russian expedition opened an exhibition in the Divine Word at University of Madang. The work of the expedition in Papua New Guinea is over and the team of researchers led by Nikolai Miklucha Maklai are now going to Australia. The diplomatic contacts between these two countries were established in 1975 after Papua New Guinea gained independence. Today Australia is their main economic partner. Our connections are rapidly growing and getting ever closer. Around 5,000 Australian companies work in Papua New Guinea. Almost 10,000 Australians live and work there. We provide humanitarian and economic aid and assistance, which amounts to $540 million a year. In Australia, we wanted to visit the places where Miklucha Maklai had lived and worked. Here, on the Green Continent, he founded a biological station on the coast of Watson's Bay. Unfortunately, these days the station is no longer used, but the interiors and exterior alike have been preserved the way they used to be before, thanks to the fact that the station has been rented to one of the companies over a long period of time and people can live there. And we were lucky, we rang the doorbell and they opened up. As my aunt says, we were ringing together and they opened because they had heard a Russian accent. After all, they are staying in the place where the Russian scientists had established this biological station. In Sydney, the unique house of Miklucha Maklai has been preserved. It's located on the coast of a picturesque bay. Along with the uh, now Russians, we, we revere and understand why he is such an important man and just wish that was shared by others. And so we really um, greatly appreciate this uh, association with uh, Nikolai and the house, which we've spent our lives restoring in a fit of madness, but uh, is now restored and the gardens restored. In the 80s, developers wanted to demolish the building. Not long before that, the Sullivan family, Janet and Colin, became the owners. Discovering that a great traveller had lived there, they decided to preserve the house. Janet wrote letters to Gorbachev, the Australian Foreign Ministry, as well as that of the Soviet Union and finally got her way. Today the house is under state protection. Moreover, Janet has initiated the creation of a park, the Miklucha Maklai Park. Today the descendants of the great Russian scientists live in the capital of Australia, as well as in the city of Melbourne. Janie Maclay is among them, the widow of Paul Maclay, the grandson of Miklucha Maclay. This expedition has also given me an opportunity to meet my relatives, as well as to connect with my personal history and at the same time the history of Miklucha Maclay. So Nikolai Miklucha Maclay had the two sons, my grandfather Alex, and his younger brother's name was Vladimir. I believe Vladimir had two sons named Kenneth and Robert, and they had also children who live in Australia now. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't meet them, 
but they, they are still there in Australia. And I have three children and they are all grown up and, they have, and my daughter only has two children. The boys don't have children yet. Hi, I'm Samantha. I'm the great, great granddaughter of Nikolai McClehoe Mackay. Um, growing up, I was always aware that my great, great grandfather was a famous Russian explorer. So that was very interesting and I've found that the, the founding of the Nikolai Mc, the McClehoe Mackay Foundation to be a very inspiring and interesting thing and something that I would like to be a part of going forward. Um, um, and in fact, I would, I would very much like to visit Papua New Guinea at some point in the future. The Australian collection of Mikluka Maclay's archive is stored at the Mitchell Library, Sydney. Here, the great traveller's descendant discovered a document supporting the naming of the northwestern coast of New Guinea, the Maclay Coast, as he was the first European to land there. Later this name was lost, but the unique finding will help to restore this name on the maps of Papua New Guinea. In the library, they also store a portrait of Mikluka Maclay by Alexei Korzuchin, painted in Sydney back in 1886, two years before the ethnographer's death. The portrait is not on public display, but it was brought out for the Maclay family. The expedition members visited the biggest university in Australia, where the Museum of William Maclay is located. He was a social activist, scientist and a friend of Maclay Sr. The museum stores items related to the great traveller. I think Australian scientists and academics highly appreciate the contribution made by Mikluka Maclay. I've talked to some, including those from the Australian Museum, and they said they still used his drawings, notes and analytical findings. It's so great to learn about Maclay and the work of the Maclay Foundation, because it is imperative that we conserve and protect this early cultural history from the Pacific region so it's not lost. We really hope that this expedition undertaken by the Maclay Foundation to Papua New Guinea and now their visit to Australia helps shed new light on the importance of Maclay's work and the collection and we really hope to collaborate in the future. In the Museum of the University of Sydney we saw the Maclay family coat of arms. This stone that we're now looking at is truly unique because first of all Maclay restored his surname making it Mikluka Maclay. Before that his family went by the name of Mikluka. While here we can see two letters M interlocked together which basically represents a coat of arms as it is placed on a heraldic stone. First until 1994 it was kept at the biological station then the station closed and they brought it here to the Museum of Maclay at the University of Sydney. Touching this stone makes my skin tingle. So the first scientific and research expedition in the footsteps of the famous traveller, scientist and humanist Nikolai Mikluka Maclay has become reality and today is already history. It's time to sum up the results. The team we've gathered has accomplished its task 100% and there's a lot to publish. A unique collection of the Maclay Coast material culture was created during the expedition, consisting of 56 items. They were all gifted by the descendants of people who knew Mikluka Maclay Sr. personally in the 19th century and lived in the same villages of Gorendo, Gumbu and Bongu. 14 items have been given to the collection of the Kunstkamera, one item to Moscow University's Museum of Anthropology, and one item to the Museum of the World Ocean. 40 items have become part of the private collection which will be displayed in museums around the world. This is one of the Okam drums. It's an amazing musical instrument still in use in New Guinea. Uh, 
These wild boar fangs are worn by men. It's an accessory worn around one's neck like this. Amazing. With Mikluka Maklai Senior, they were unwilling to trade it even for an axe, although they didn't know anything about iron back then. Maklai truly met people of the Stone Age. And here we have a model of a barum. Barum is a big drum used to summon an entire village for a meeting. We saw the same drum in the village this time. This is a very valuable gift, characteristic of the people of Gorendu. Dog fangs. They told me that if one wore these fangs, people would always know that you came from Garendu, even before you said anything, and I hope that's how it will be. This plate was given to me by one of Tui's descendants. He was the first Papuan to meet Mikluka Maklai. After he underwent initiation, they gave him this plate. In many families, it was used as the bride price, and in some villages, they even say it's their money. These traditions have been preserved to this day, and you know, we could learn from that. For if we now ask somebody to wear traditional clothes, it will be hard to find a shop which sells them. So we should help to preserve this collection, and we're planning to put it on display around the globe, because it's extremely popular. It's in demand. We can compare what it used to be like to what we have now. Almost nothing has changed. Even upon the expedition's return to Russia, the research was not over. In St. Petersburg, the city where the great scientist and traveller used to live, even nowadays there are opportunities for discovery. Now I'm going to see a man who called me and said he had some of Putilov's records. And Putilov was a man who collected folklore in New Guinea after the first expedition. I don't yet know what awaits me there, but it must be some amazing Soviet time records I don't know of. I must find that out today. I think it should be here. So, where's the entrance? It must be over there. Good afternoon, Gennady. Glad to see you. Gennady Lyubimov is an experienced St. Petersburg sound director with a track record of almost 50 years. At times, he had a chance to speak to legends recording unique plays or poets reading their verse. Over 700 phonograph records have passed through his hands, including that which he was preparing for release while processing the records brought from New Guinea. Come in, I'll show you everything. This one. I want to show you the product of my collaboration with the author of this idea, Boris Putilov. The Rhythms of Oceania, the Trail of Mikluka Maklai. It's from that Soviet expedition of 1971. Wow, that's simply amazing. Melodia Records, Leningrad. The Rhythms and Music of Oceania. Bongu Village to dear esteemed Gennady Lubimov in memory of our collaboration and with gratitude for his excellent work, Boris Putilov, January the 5th, 1979. Gennady, why have you decided to call me after all this? I knew it was a very rare record and that no one else in Leningrad had it, so I called you in order to preserve it for future generations. Shall we listen to it? With pleasure. You can hear waves lapping against the shore. It's only a few dozen meters away from the spot where Maclay's hut used to stand.
And these are the sounds of a tropical forest which comes right up to Cape Garagasi, just like a hundred years ago. Boris Putilov himself is reading the explanatory text. His voice sounds firm, even stern. One can sense that the author is focused. This expedition became a turning point in the life of Putilov, an expert of world epic heritage, folklore specialist and traveler. Thanks to Putilov and, of course, Gennady Lubimov, the world has heard the sounds of distant New Guinea as if Papuan drums were being played right outside one's door. Comparing what we saw with the descriptions given by Miklucha Maklai, I've become firmly convinced these are the same dances and little has changed in them in a hundred years. I had to go to Pushkin House. It's there that they store Putilov's collections. It's the man who collected folklore from New Guinea, in particular from that Soviet expedition organized more than 40 years ago. So it is there that we can find such a wealth of knowledge and folklore which no one but Putilov ever collected or wrote down. For 10 years, from 1957 to 1967, Boris Putilov worked at the Pushkin House as the head of the folklore section, then moved to the Kunstkammer, which was at the time the Leningrad part of the Miklucha Maklai Institute of Ethnography and Anthropology. It was then that he was enlisted as a member of a scientific expedition to New Guinea. Thank you so much, Nikolai, for rekindling the interest in the cultural heritage of your ancestor. I think your effort is extremely important and very timely too, for understanding our national identity, how great we used to be and what we should strive for. It's important, not only in the 20th or 21st century, but in any epoch. It's crucial that for people, young people, the figure and achievements of Miklucha Maklai be available, accessible, as he's the man who discovered this very truth of man's existence on this planet. His connection with the land, so ancestral, so accurate, and it's everywhere, not only in the rites or faces, not only in those fascinating facial expressions, it's also in the intonation of songs and rites coming from their land. It's of great importance to people in any century. In order to organize the expedition, I've established the Miklucha Maklai Foundation for the Preservation of Ethnic and Cultural Heritage. The very aims and objectives of this foundation are to promote the heritage of Miklucha Maklai and tell people about him and his humanist ideas. I didn't expect people would be so interested. Yet after the expedition remembering Miklucha Maklai, they started asking themselves what the life there is like now. So we started organizing lectures and exhibitions. Children are interested too. And they began to prepare letters addressing Papuans. We meet and hold various events and we called our project the Miklucha Maklai 21st Century Living History. All of that helps us to remind people of Miklucha Maklai and the guidelines that should be followed. Our recent expedition is just the beginning. Only now do I realize that, when it has had a great effect, when so many people have become interested in these ideas. And the white snow that we have in Russia is like a white canvas where we'll be able to paint whatever we like. And we have a lot of plans, loads of them. Nikolai Miklucha Maklai is dreaming about new expeditions to New Guinea. He wants to transform into reality some of the valuable and still relevant ideas of the famous traveller. 
to establish close and regular contact with Papua New Guinea and to create a special ethnographical park in this unique nook of the world. There where one day, a man from the moon landed. Papua 